we've now worked with the county, so they're well aware of all of our materials. And so when somebody opts out, they can make that information available to the, to the survivors. Um, we have done media outreach. Um, it's at the point now where uh, a lot of the media is aware of the information. So we haven't done as many interviews, but the information is still getting out there and still getting used. Uh, social media, we, we have done a lot. One of the areas that we're trying to focus on, uh, and we had mentioned it in the last meeting, talking about social media, a couple, actually three years ago, after the first fires in Santa Rosa, I reached out to next door because we were starting to see that as being a more, you know, a, a, a very popular area and wanted to see if we might be able to do some work with them and be able to get a page. At the time, they were only focusing on uh, local, like either cities or counties to let those government agencies be part of it. As you can see on page 166, though, we were able to get them to allow us to post into nine different counties around California. And those were the nine counties that were affected in 2018. We, so we use this as one of our outreach tools. We've tried to go back to next door to see if they will expand. The office at the time, the Office of Emergency Services was the only other uh, state agency that was allowed to post to the state. At this point, though, they're telling us that they are not going to allow us to go into any other uh, counties because they, they they don't understand that we're a law enforcement agency. They said you can only we're only going to use law enforcement agencies. So we're still trying to work with them. They have offered us the opportunity to buy sponsorships um, to be able to buy our way onto the sites, but um, that isn't really financially feasible. The cost would be somewhere in the neighborhood of one hundred and fifty thousand dollars a year, and that that just doesn't make sense for us financially. And, and it really we really should be on on their the free site as a government agency that does law enforcement so that's something that that i'm sure that that i'll leave in my list for my my whoever's going to follow me up in this seat so they'll be able to follow up on that but next door is a, a good feature we do have these nine counties that we're able to reach out to and we've had a lot of success uh, we are doing a lot more postings fire related for the ones that have fires right now in a lot of these same counties as i mentioned we do have the disaster hotline and the wildfire workshops we are in the process now uh, that the evacuation is over and people are starting to go through the insurance efforts. We are now reaching out to the counties to let them know that we would like to work with them on workshops. So I would like to you know, make the appeal to the committee members and all the board members if they're listening. Um, if there's any of that outreach that you would like to be involved in, whether it's in your area where you may live or if there's something that you would like us to include you in, please let us know. And as we develop these um, workshops or get things scheduled, we would certainly love to include you as well. So we are reaching out to some of the, uh, the, the different areas now um, and trying to set them up. At the bottom of 167, um, I just wanted to note briefly that um, there, when we had our rash of wildfires here, they had a very similar rash of, of devastating wildfires just to the north of us in the state of Oregon. And as you can see there, at least 11 people were killed up there and 5,700 structures. So while not as many as here in California, still that's devastating for the state of Oregon. Um, and and they're facing some of the same rebuilding challenges that we have. So uh, as you can see at the end of September, the registrar set up a, a meeting with the officials, um, senior officials at the Oregon Construction Contractors Board. And so we all got on a, a WebEx call and spent time with them going over our know, best practices, the kinds of things we see, the kinds of things they should be looking for. And I think they were very receptive to that. And I think our goal, especially working through through NASCLA, which is our uh, big contractor licensing agency, group that we're part of is we want to share our best practices. We tend to be on the leading edge when it comes to regulating this industry. And and we've got a reputation and a history of always, you know, trying to help out our, our other states who are doing similar things. So that that was good to have that. And I'm sure over time we'll have more contact and, and working with the Oregon board. Now, finally, I wanted just to note uh, complaints. Obviously, the the reason, the, one of the main reasons we do this is because we feel like an educated consumer there's less chance that they're going to have problems with their rebuilding projects and then have to file a complaint. So what we did is we we do we have begun over the last few three years tracking uh, complaints that come in that are related to the disasters. So uh, as you can see here on page 168, when we went through and we reviewed those complaints, that we really came away with a feeling that that our work on the outreach side has really been successful. Uh, we receive an average of 30 disaster related complaints complaints a month, that's maybe one a day. And as I mentioned earlier, we've, I haven't run the total of, of fires over the last three years, but we've got to probably have 
25,000 structures, something like that, that have, that have been destroyed around the state. So we get about a complaint, the average of a complaint a day. So um, that's a, a substantial improvement to the 90 complaints we got a day back in the mid-90s in the Northridge quake that I mentioned earlier in 1994. Now, a small handful of those complaints have led to administrative actions or criminal referrals to a local prosecutor. I did include a media story there that it was referred to briefly in the uh, enforcement meeting. Fortunately, the, the serious cases have been few and far in between. This one, we had, I think, 14 consumer complaints against this contractor. The vast majority of, of complaints we get, there's one against a contractor, some that have been two. There's only been a handful that have gotten more than two complaints. So that really does lead us to the, the reassurance that the hard work and the dedication that the board makes is really successful and has helped protect um, the, the people as they go through the, the very long and difficult rebuilding process. So, Madam Chair, that is a look at the response to the wildfires. I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you, Rick. Would any committee members like to ask any questions or have any comments? Seeing none, or, go ahead. I raised my hand, sorry. Sorry. Um, I'd just like to make a comment that in regards to like what you noted, uh, Rick, in regards to the social media, you, know, you said that on page 166 there, um, though not everybody when they go through a disaster always has the ability to still connect with computers or their cell phones and stuff. Um, it, uh, it is a method that works, but that boots on the ground program and the signage that goes up it's everlasting and it's great and I hope we continue to keep doing that because as someone who just keeps getting pulled back into each and every disaster and just work the North Complex one, um, those are critical and they're really important and they also serve the need of the, the individuals that are affected by this that you're there for them, that CSLB is still out there protecting them when they see those signs and they drive by them over and over. It's really good for them to know somebody's having their back. So it's really good, um, and I hope we continue to keep doing that um, with those that signage. And then in regards to the workshops, those are very beneficial, and as you know, I'm always available to help with those. Um, and just huge kudos to this group, to all the different, the SWIFT, to the your staff and the CSLB staff members that work on these disasters because with the disasters comes a lot of emotions and when you work in those LACs, uh, the local assistance centers, and you speak with these individuals on the phone, you know, it's it's real trying and it's really, uh, there. I've heard lots of good stories of staff comforting them and helping them and guiding them in the right way. Even if it might not even be CSLB, they refer them to the right agency. So uh, huge kudos out to the group. Um, it seems like it's never ending. Let's hope we have less and less, but um, thank you. Yeah, thank you. If I could just say a couple of things, well, just so the, the other committee members know, uh, I didn't really go into a lot of details on the signs. We do have two signs that we post. They're in English on one side and Spanish on the other side. One warns the homeowners that they may be solicited by unlicensed or unscrupulous contractors to be aware of that. The other one is a warning for unlicensed contractors that they may face a felony charge if they're caught contracting without a license in the disaster area. And the other thing about those signs is we we spent a little bit extra money when we got them and made them heavy duty, real corrugated plastic. And so it's funny, I, a couple of months ago, I went and then actually doing the research for this, went to a Google ground shot from Coffee Park. If you heard of that area in Santa Rosa where the, the whole subdivision was pretty much destroyed and went to where we had actually done a our press conference after the wildfire and in the Google ground. Now the houses are all built around it, but our sign is still there in the yard. There was one lot that was still open and our sign was still there and you could read it. So part of our, our goal there is to get them out there and, and they will, they will stand the test of time until somebody removes them. Thank you. And thank you, Nancy. Are there any other committee members that wish to comment or have any questions? Okay, before I move forward and to the public comments, I just want to say that I, Rick and I have been talking very briefly about trying to find workshops and ways to work with senior centers to try to put on pro different types of programs. So I'm hopeful to continue those conversations going forward into the future. Rick, are there any public comments? Uh, there are no comments from the public at this time. Okay, then our next agenda item is item D. And it is an update and discussion on outreach efforts to potential licenses. 
for that, I'll turn the floor back over to Rick. Okay, thank you. Uh, we were on page 173. Okay, um, the, the beginning of this starts with, with the overview. We want the committee to understand just what's happened with our license population over the last 10 years. We reached a peak of licenses back in the year 2009. Uh, just before the the recession hit and, and things really took a dive so we reached that that peak then in 2009 then after that we saw our license numbers both active and inactive licenses drop for nine straight years and while that number has inched up slightly over the past two years today there are about 32,000 fewer licensed contractors in the state than there were 12 years ago in doing research too, we did find out that actually over roughly the same time, the number of people actually employed in the construction industry grew by almost a third to 840,000 people. So those statistics raise the question for us, is there anything that we can do to help attract people who are in the industry to actually take the next step and go move to get their contractor's license? So our public affairs office took uh, the lead on three different initiatives to provide support to the licensing committee on a fourth item. It's focused on developing outreach programs to help encourage more people to get their contractor's license. And those include a new program to promote the recently approved B2 license classification. And that's going to be a big deal for public affairs and for the whole board over the, the next uh, year or so as we develop this new classification. We really, as the, the committee members know, this is in many ways can be a, a game changer for the industry. So there'll be a lot of important outreach that's going to have to be developed. We also have created the online Get Licensed to Build um, applicant workshop, and a number of our, our board members have actually you know, appeared and joined us on those to do welcomes. We have another one coming up this Friday. And uh, Jim Wayne is on our uh, Ledge and Licensing Committee. He's our License co Committee Chair. He'll be joining us at the beginning of that to offer a welcome. But we usually get somewhere between 200 and 300, 350 people that join us on that workshop that we go through the license application. Um, the kind of information we're looking for and we help them out so they can you know, do a much better job filling out their application and then go through what's required. The new things we're looking at doing too is a new program focused on minorities and low income communities and a program focused on women in construction. Again, many of that's, that's going to be done a lot as with the uh, licensing committee. So as reported by the Bureau of Labor Statistics from January 10th through August of 2020, Construction employment in California grew by 281,000 people. During that same period, as I mentioned, our license population dropped by over 24,000 from 307,000 contractors to 200 and just under 283,000. So that re re revealed a significant increase in the number and a simultaneous decrease. And so that's where the ideas came up to, to, to focus on this. I won't go through it, but the charts on 174, you can see the year by year breakdown of, of the number of construction workers in California. You can, you can see how those numbers have, have grown. And then you can also see the information about the how our license population has decreased. You can see in the far right column on the top of 175 there, if you can tell that the numbers that are in green is when the years the license population has gone up, you can see especially in, in 2008, 2007, you know, it grew a lot, slowed down, and then hit the skids uh, in 2009, 2010, and you can see dropped. And then we saw a little bit of an increase in the year 2018, which is reflected in the January 2019 numbers, and a little bit slower increase uh, in January of this year. And you can see as of October 1st, we actually, our numbers have gone down about 2,700. Part of that's due to the COVID and uh, the fact that we had our testing centers closed for uh, a couple of months and so that that's building back things things have steadied now and we actually are seeing a little bit of growth which is a good thing on 175 it's what i mentioned there's just more information about the b2 the get licensed to uh, workshop now the area is about the underrepresented communities again we want to focus on um, making sure that we're putting our information out to areas that are maybe frequented or that have more opportunities to to get to minorities and people with low income that may be in the construction industry that that uh, to let them know what the possibilities are for them to improve their their situations and also as i mentioned for attracting more women to the construction industry and there'll be more uh, discussed about that in coming up in the licensing committee meeting 
As far as the next steps, we're going to be using this information gathered to look to try to establish some uh, um, future partnerships and and look for the areas and the ways that we want to reach out. We've already got a meeting, I believe, coming up next week with uh, the LA Urban League and other groups that uh, that uh, we're going to be reaching out. There is also one person in our enforcement operation down in Norwalk who's assisting us with this, and she's uh, been able to make contact with the uh, the LA Urban League. So. I'm happy to answer any questions, but we just wanted to bring this to the board's attention as a way that we can hopefully, uh, you know, look to bring more people into the fold and to help them grow their careers in construction. Thank you, Rick. Any questions or comments from any committee members? Nancy? Yes. Um, I have a question, Rick, in regards to the creation of the new B2 license um, in regards to public affairs. Is there going to be any kind of a launch um, through social media or through publications, or is there going to be any kind of a video to kind of explain this, flyers or anything, to kind of kick this off? Yeah, there is. The, the first step, we're in production of our uh, fall newsletter right now, so there'll be information in that as well as industry bulletins. We'll create a whole a, a lot of website content. Social media is, is obviously going to be a big play place that we're going to be promoting that. So yeah, there's going to be lots of different elements, lots of ways that we're going to be reaching out to let them know. And the first step I think we're going to take is we've already gotten some feedback. Our testing unit is already starting to work on um, putting together the, the exams. And so they're starting to hear from some of the licensees questioning, you know, why is this B2 needed? So I think some of our first um, outreach is going to be you know, trying to explain the need for this and just what it means and how it's not really, we don't see it as being a threat to the, the B or the future B1 license, but it's just going to help address the need in this industry and a, a need uh, to help those people that can't qualify for the full B license that are not doing uh, work that involves the framing or structural work. So yes, to answer your question in short, shorter way, yeah, we're, there's going to be lots of different elements. We'll use every tool that we can to uh, to reach out and to let people know about it. Thank you, thank you, Nancy. Are there any other questions or comments from committee members? Seeing none, Rick, are there any public comments? Yes, we do have one public comment. One person with their hand up, Scott Lestraco. Um, you go ahead and um, please make your comments. Uh. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. What's the difference between the B and the B2 specifically? And so what would be the, the difference in testing? I'm sorry? And what would be the difference in the testing between the two? Okay, thank you. I I, I know we've got, I don't know, Mike Jemniski, who's our, our ledge chief, or Justin Paddock, who's our licensee, they might be in a better position to, uh, to answer that. Rick, this is Dave. I can answer that question. Uh, Even better. The difference is uh, with the new B2, we call it the residential remodeling classification. Uh, it's, it was developed so that it will meet the remodeling needs of consumers. The general building class that we currently have requires that the applicant have substantial framing or rough carpentry experience. And what we found is a lot of remodeling contractors don't have that experience. And when, when their workers apply to become a licensed contractor, they don't meet the minimum qualifications. And we've done a study and found that up to 50% of our applications for remodeling are denied. And so we look at that as one reason why our population has decreased. And it's very important to us that when we develop the exam for the new classification, that it focuses on the workmanship issues we're seeing in the remodeling industry I look at the tree, the law and business exam will be just exactly the same for the two classifications. The trade exam will differ in that the new classification won't have as many questions relating to framing and rough carpentry, but have more of an emphasis on the workmanship issues that we're seeing with our consumer filed complaints. Okay, Madam Chair, that is the only public comment we've gotten. Okay, and thank you. Uh Day for the explanation. Moving into our final agenda item today, uh, review, discussion, and possible action to amend CSLB's 2019-21 Public Affairs Strategic Plan objectives. This starts on page 171 of your meeting packet, and I'll turn it back to Rick again to um, give us some updates. 
All right, thank you. We are on page 181. We'll start with 4.1, which is the distribution of a calendar of key meetings, events, activities to board members to uh, increase participation and your abilities to advocate on the board's behalf. Uh, that had already been completed with COVID. There really ha hasn't been a lot of any public events that that you would be able to participate in, as I mentioned earlier in this meeting, as we develop the, the plans for workshops for the um, disasters, we would certainly welcome the opportunities to, to include you. And so we, that's something that will probably be coming back as we send this out usually at the first of the month, let you know what's happening for that month. Uh, if there's anything in, in particular you have interest or potentially legislators that you have an interest in, we also have our senior scam stoppers. We have um, we've started on a limited basis bringing those back as uh, as was mentioned earlier. Uh, Jane Kreidler, who is our outreach coordinator, uh, left our board a couple months ago, and so we we are not filling that position this time being because of COVID. There just isn't enough for full-time work until things get going again. So we are picking up, we've got a couple of them scheduled for this month virtually. So at some point when the schedule gets big enough or we have a way that we can involve board members, we'll be able to do that. <laughs> Item 4.2. Is the disaster relief? It was mentioned briefly in the enforcement program. Um, what we're doing now is we are we've got the drafts finished for that, and what we're doing is we're updating it to reflect some of the changes that I discussed because of COVID. So I've got uh, two and a half days to get that finished uh, before I leave, and that's my goal. That's one of the things I'm going to get finished. So that's uh, it's listed as there com is completed, but I am going to update that because of COVID. Item four point three is the workload workload analysis that was no longer needed. Um, we were uh, granted an additional position for our TV specialist for our full-time video person who we've had on staff for a number of months now. Item 4.4 is the item in partnership with enforcement to implement the plan to identify opportunities to increase enforcement actions, the publicity on those, and relaunch the most wanted, as was mentioned in the enforcement committee meeting. That, that has been completed. We have uh, added people to the most wanted. Um, we, we are updating that, and we um, we are adding people as the, they come to us. So that item is completed. 4.5, the feasibility of a text alert program. The proposed target date is uh, for the feasibility. This was, at, I believe, at, at the September meeting. This was this implementation date was moved back to December 2020. So that is coming up. So we've addressed the feasibility. But right now, other IT priorities and the resources now in public affairs with a couple of us being gone is, is not really enabling us to do that. The other thing that's kind of holding back is, is a text system isn't really going to help us right now because we don't gather text numbers from, from our licensees. So we're trying to begin figuring out a way that we went to with it. That's going to be part of the renewal or some other way, but that has to be developed. So it's probably going to be tied to that once we start getting enough phone numbers to be able to text out to um, to our licensees or down the road when we look at having an online application. Item 4.6 is expanding the website. Uh, that's an ongoing thing. September 2019, we did complete that, but it is ongoing. We are working with uh, IT staff on that on an ongoing basis. Item 4.7 is a partnership with licensing and information technology to develop the online original contractors app. That's just what I mentioned, the online app. Uh, some of the focus have been changed to do the online renewals, which we've made great progress and have some of those already in place. And but that is still a, a priority. We've got the proposed target date now is is for December, so in the next year. So that will be work that will be continuing. We are in a support role right now to both licensing and IT. Item four point eight is an orientation video for new staff. Um, now that we do have our video folks in, in place, we are working on this right now. It's in production. We expect to have that done before February of next year. Item four point nine. Again, with the, the IT unit to review and update web content to make sure it's accurate and accessible. One of the challenges of websites is that information does become dated at some point, and sometimes laws change. Sometimes there's just references that need to be updated. And also, we've had uh, the big challenges to make sure where our site is in compliance with the Americans with Disabilities Act standards. So we are working on that on an ongoing basis. We have our student assistant updating a lot of our historical materials that we had to pull offline. Uh, because it didn't meet the ADA requirements. So that's an ongoing project. And finally, uh, item 4.10 is in partnership with enforcement and licensing for the online courses. As was mentioned in the enforcement meeting, 
the first one, the billion officials, which Nancy played a big part in us being able to complete that. That is up and online. It's being used when letters of admonishment for building permit violations get issued to licensees. They are required to go to the website and watch the video and, and go through that information. And we're looking for those opportunities to expand those courses in the future. That is it for the strategic plan updates. Okay, thank you, Rick. And just to clarify, Rick's report started on page 181 as opposed to page 171, as I had said earlier. Since there are no requested changes, there's no need for a committee vote on this item, but do any committee members have any comments or questions on these items? Are there any public comments, Rick? Uh, no, there are no public comments for this item. Okay, thank you. That completes today's committee meeting agenda items. Can I please get a motion and a second to adjourn? Thank you. Move. Second. Okay, the committee members have motioned and second. Thank you. We are adjourned. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Bye, everybody. Bye. Bye. <laughs> Have a good day. Be safe. Okay. okay so Does anyone, uh, anyone need a little break before we start? Are we okay? And I'll turn it over to committee chair Jim, and I don't want to mispronounce his last name, so I won't for the licensing committee chair. <laughs> thank you, Diana. Jim <laughs> Ruane. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you. Does anyone need a, a break? Are we ready to rock and roll here? Looks like we're good. Okay. Uh, good morning. The time is 1117 AM and I'd like to call the November 4th, 2020 meeting of the California Contractor State License Board Licensing Committee. I'm Jim Ruane, the committee's chair. Please note that only board members who are members of the licensing committee may participate in the meeting. Other board members who are in attendance may observe but cannot ask questions or participate in the discussion. To committee members, we will start our meeting with our cameras on, but if we experience any bandwidth issues, I may ask you later to turn off your video camera. When you would like to comment at any time throughout the meeting, please select the raise your hand icon in the WebEx application. I will call on committee members to speak. When called upon, please unmute yourself, and when you are finished, return to mute. You will also need to click on the raise your hand icon again to lower your hand. Joining us today is Registrar David Fote, Chief Deputy Registrar Tanya Cochran, CSLB staff and our board legal counsel, Jason Hurtado. Uh, Feliz, could you please call the roll? Hello, can you hear me? Yes. Jim away. Here. Here. Frank Altamira? Here. Huggy Beltran? Here. Arnie Gobos? Here. Miguel Galarza? Here. Susan Grandella? Susan? Here. Here. Mary Tyker? Here. Thank you. Okay. Committee members, we have two new board members that were recently appointed joining the committee today. Rodney Cobos and Miguel Galarza. A gentleman, do you mind briefly introducing yourselves? And I'll begin with Rodney. Uh, uh, good morning, everyone. My name is Rodney Cobos with the uh, work for the Southern California Pipe Trades. And I'd just like to thank everyone so far that has been so helpful in uh, getting me situated with uh, getting on the board. So thank you. Thank you, Rodney. Miguel, would you please introduce yourself? Yeah, thank you, uh, Jim. Uh, Miguel Galarza, uh, the owner of Yerba Buena Engineering Construction here in San Francisco. Um, born and raised here in San Francisco and currently live in Millbrae. And uh, everybody's been uh, very accommodating and welcoming to me, to the committee. I'm looking forward to uh, rolling up my sleeves, if I had sleeves, and uh, making it happen. Great. Thank you both and welcome. The next item is item B, public comment session for items not on the agenda and future agenda items requests. Next is item B, our public comment section. This item is provided for public comment pertaining to items not on this agenda. To allow the committee enough time to conduct its full schedule of business, I will be limiting public comments to three minutes apiece. 
Please note that state law prohibits committee members from discussing any matter brought up during public comment. We are also not allowed to act on any item not on this agenda. If you want the committee to discuss a topic not on the agenda, you can ask us to consider placing that issue on the agenda of a future meeting. If you have an application, complaint, or disciplinary charges pending before the board, we ask that you not discuss the details of your case or pending complaint. Committee members are not permitted to receive evidence or information that is not part of the administrative record in the case. If your comments are related to a specific agenda item, you can make your comments now, but you may want to wait until that item comes up for discussion. We will ask for public comment before acting on any item. Members of the public, if you joined us on WebEx and would like to make a comment at this time, either raise your hand or use the chat feature to send us a note that you would like to offer public comment. If you joined us by phone and would like to make a public comment, please press star three to raise your hand. We will use the same system throughout the meeting for public comment during each agenda item. Rick Lopes is our moderator today. He will be assisting us by monitoring the public teleconference line. And Rick, on behalf of the licensing committee, I know uh, we're really gonna miss you and we all wish you the very best of luck going forward. Thank you. Okay, are there any uh, public comments now, Rick, or anything we need to address at this time? No, Mr. Chair, I've got one hand that's up from the previous meeting, so I don't know if there's a new comment from this um, person. So I'm just gonna open the line real quick. And Scott Lestraco, do you have a new comment for this meeting or if not, if you can just lower your hand? Not, not hearing anything, but um, um, yes, other than that, no public comment. Thank you very much. <clears throat> Our next item is item C, review and discussion on policy changes related to signature requirements on CSLB license renewal applications. Please turn to page 193 for agenda item C. As many of you know, our licensing division continues to explore ways to improve procedures for how individuals apply for and maintain their license with the board. One way to do this is to minimize how many renewals CSLB must return each month because it receives the wrong signatures. Currently, staff require qualifiers and other specified individuals on a license to sign a renewal or it is returned. Additionally, if an individual signs that is not listed on the license, for example, the bookkeeper or office manager signs, we will return it and ask the company to remove the signature. In 2019, staff asked the board to consider a legislative proposal for signature requirements and the board chose not to take up the matter at that time. Staff subsequently met with the board's legal counsel, Jason Hurtado, and determined under current law, only qualifiers are required to sign and there is no need to return a renewal if someone not listed as personnel of record signed it in addition to the qualifier or qualifiers. It is important to note that the procedural change staff is proposing is number one, only to renew a license and not for other functions Number two, if someone signs that may be an undisclosed officer, the matter can be referred to enforcement for further review. And number three, staff will continue to ensure licensee information remains consistent with board records and the California Secretary of State's office. Staff plans to change its internal procedures on November 16, 2020, and believes this will significantly reduce the number of renewals we currently return. No committee or board action is necessary at this time. Uh, any comment uh, from the public on this, Rick? Sorry, lost my mute button. Uh, no public comment at this time. Anything from uh, the members of the committee? Yeah, Jim, um, how many on average uh, applications are returned? How big, it be? how big of an issue is this? Um, we do have a significant return rate, but it really fluctuates throughout the year. As you would expect, you kind of see it in the holidays a little bit more. Um, we're usually under 10%, but, but it does fluctuate. Um, we're just trying to get as efficient as we can. Thank you. And Mr. Chair, actually, I do have a member of the public that has raised their hand there on the telephone, so I'll go ahead and mute your line. Uh, please go ahead and make your public comment. Do we have somebody on the phone who would like to make a public comment at this time? If so, please unmute your phone. And Hi. Talk. There you go. Hi, go ahead. We can, yes, we can hear you now. Thank you. Hi, this is Phil Vermeulen. I'm president and CEO of Contractor Licensing Center 
and worked extensively with contractors and have for over the last 40 years. And I cannot emphasize enough that this is a very excellent move and highly recommend that you do this. I can't begin to tell you how many problems we get with calls from clients who have uh, sent in either the wrong signatures or not for once. Uh, this will save up a lot of your staff. So for all of those reasons, I strongly recommend that you uh, move forward with this. Thanks. Thanks for your comment. That is the only public comment at this point. Thank you very much, Rick. The next item is item D, an update in discussion on the outreach efforts to increase women's participation in construction. Please turn to page 197 for agenda item D. Some of you may know that I also serve as president of the Wall and Ceiling Alliance. And one area I'm passionately pursuing in that role is increasing women participation in the construction industry. I've met with CSLB staff on several occasions to help promote this for the construction industry. A special thanks to Rick Lopes and Public Affairs, staff has established a three-phase outreach plan that's in your booklet. To assist staff and to ensure industry participation, board member Mary Teichert and I volunteered to oversee this effort. I am pleased to announce that Board Chair De La Torre recently appointed us both to a two-person advisory committee for this purpose. Mary, I know you're there. Would you like to add anything? I very much appreciate the initiative. I think there's a whole lot of untapped talent and it could be potentially interested in our line of work. So I appreciate that we're working on this. There's no committee or board action necessary at this time. Uh, Rick, uh, any, any committee members or want to comment on this at all? Yeah, this is Augie. Um, as you know, we have a very vibrant women's uh, uh, group here in the Carpenters Union and the Sisters in the Brotherhood number in the hundreds here in Northern California. If we can do anything to help out in this initiative, we'd love to uh, participate with this. Thank you, Augie, and I appreciate that. And I know uh, we've reached out to the laborers and a lot of other the uh, the uh, um, uh, you know, union union outreach uh, participation. And I, I think it's going to be great going forward because I, I see a real need and uh, it's going to be great for the for the industry. Just people with the tools and also contractors that sit uh, that sit as Mary do. It's it's going to be going to be nice working, working with all of you going forward. Thank you very much. Appreciate it. Any uh, comment from the public, Rick? Uh, no public comment on this item. All right. Thank you. Item E, review discussion of possible action to amend CSLB's 2019-2021 licensing strategic plan. Please turn to page 203 for agenda item E. There are no deadlines that staff are currently seeking to change on the licensing strategic plan, but I have asked Justin to give us a brief update on the status of these other items. Justin? Justin? Good morning, board members. Uh, I'll just quickly run through these. I think a lot of these have already been touched on on other committees. Um, the first one, 1.1, 1 .1, that's creating our online asbestos open book examination. Uh, that was completed and is underway and actually being quite successful. Um, number 1.2 um, is uh, just updating industry bulletins. This is something that we continue to do ongoing. Uh, the most recent one that we have is on service station equipment. Um, and throughout the year, we, we update, update those regularly based on issues we see. Um, item 1.3, um, looking at the uh, B2 license classification that's already been discussed at our meeting today. Um, thanks to our legislative um, office, that bill was passed and we're currently in exam development as was already discussed. Um, uh, the next phase of our exam development actually will be kicking off very shortly, which is the occupational analysis. Um, item 1.4, um, I am happy to report, um, I heard from our legislative office this morning, we filed our regulations with the Office of Administrative Law yesterday. Um, so those regulations should be in play very shortly with regard to our criminal background checks um, and some legislative changes that occurred last year with Assembly Bill 2138. With regard to item 1.5, um, working with the legislative committee, um, we're looking on bonding requirements. Uh, Mike will have uh, more of an update for you just very shortly. Um, worked with his office on this, um, and he'll be presenting uh, the full report shortly. Um, item 1.6, um, looking at the researching of outsourcing our test administration. Um, we're currently working with DCA to um, go through that transition as we speak. Again, thanks to the legislative office, we do have the legislative authority now to pursue that. 
Um, item 1.8, um, we're looking at the feasibility of continuing education and online testing. Just due to COVID and a couple of other priorities, we have set that aside. We haven't begun it yet, um, but we still see no issues with being on track for our deadline of the end of next year. Uh, moving to the last page, item 1.9, our Public Affairs Enforcement Division, working with them on online courses to educate licensees. Uh, the Enforcement Division already touched on that, so I'll skip that item unless there's questions at the end. Um, item 1.10 um, is also it's a public affairs item on um, increasing transparency on our website. Rick already previously spoke to that one. Moving to item 1.11, um, evaluate call center processes and procedures. Um, we're actually in the process of upgrading our call center, which we hope um, by next Monday or about midweek next week, um, staff will be able to actually answer the phone line from remote work um, stations through laptops. Uh, we're working on that as we speak. We're also um, working to remove some of the um, externalities of our phone tree to just keep it more simple for those who call in. Um, and we're ongoing with updating our manual as we speak. Uh, finally, item 1.12, uh, review of subject matter expert pool. That is an ongoing thing that the testing division does. I'm happy to give you any updates, but we're continually trying to look for those out there who want to help us participate, especially in the era of COVID where a lot of this is going remote. I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you. Uh, Jim, I think you're uh, muted. Uh, no, nope, hear me now? Okay, good. Uh, <clears throat> no committee or board action is necessary at this time. Are there any committee member comments or questions for Justin? Uh, Rick, any public comment? Uh, no public comment. All right, thank you. Our next item is adjournment. Uh, there will be no other items on the agenda for today. After we adjourn, um, I'll turn it over to Augie Beltran. Uh, for legislative and uh, he can decide if uh, people want a five minute break or not. Um, do I have a motion to adjourn the licensing committee? Motion to adjourn. Second? second. There's a second. 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 All right, thank you. Police, please call the roll. And I apologize for interrupting Jim. It looks like we don't need the roll. Uh, Tanya, okay. Tanya set me straight on that. That's good. Now that we'll do that for future. This meeting is adjourned. Thank you. All righty. Um, it's 11.32 right now. Let's come back at 11.40. Everybody can have a small break because I think this is going to go at least 40 minutes. So we'll be back at the 11.40.